we're glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. And now, here's Charles Caps. In Romans chapter 3, let's read from verse 10. But now, remember our overall theme in this seminar is understanding what we know about faith. See, you've all, some of you said it, I've said it myself in times past, and still say it on occasions. You know, I don't understand all I know about this subject, but you st if you continue in the Word of God, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's continuing in the Word that causes understanding to come. And uh, here we have a statement that I want to deal with because it's, it's very misunderstood. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unfruitful, unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, he goes on further with that. I will stop there and skip down to the 19th verse, because you see, if you continue in the Word. Now, if you stop there, you'd say, and you hear people say this, well, you know what the Bible said, there's none righteous. No, the Bible didn't say that. That statement is in the Bible, but the Bible didn't say that. For the Bible to say that, it has to be a truth that is woven through the Scriptures more than one place in the Bible. Now, where did it say that? See, verse 19 puts balance into this thing. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be, may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. There's none righteous in their self. You know, the Scripture says, uh, your man's righteousness is filthy rags. Now, see, people misunderstood this uh, years ago, and I think there, more of them are coming around to it now. But a, a, a prominent don denomination had, uh, would not allow David Engel's tapes to be, be played in their churches and, uh, because he had a song. He wrote a song called, I Am the Righteousness of God in Christ. Now, what are they going to do with, with the other Scriptures, you see? They said, the Bible says there's none righteous. No, the Bible didn't say that. See, for the Bible to say that, you, it has to be in context. Under the old covenant, there was none righteous. But under the new covenant, this is what Paul is teaching right here, is righteousness when he brings this up. Now watch what he goes on to say. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, because for by the law, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now see, he says the very opposite of what they said the Bible said. When you hear somebody with that whine in their voice, they say, well, now you know what the Bible said. You better get your helmet down. You're fixing to hear something the Bible didn't say at all. <laughs> it may be a statement in the Bible, but how many of you know there can be a statement in the Bible is not what the Bible said? For instance, Ananias and Sapphira said, yes, we sold the land for so much. So did the Bible say that they sold the land for so much? No, Ananias and Sapphira did, and they just recorded what they said, and they lied about it. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we beat the poor old sinner over the head with this verse till we beat his head bloody. No wonder he didn't want to come to church. You know, like uh, someone said, you beat a, a hog's head bloody every come, time he comes to the feed trough, and he won't show up after a while. But notice what he's teaching here. He's teaching righteousness when he what he's saying is that we've all sinned. We all came out of the same boat. Yep. Not any difference in any of us. Like I heard Brother Copeland say one time. Somebody asked him, said, Brother Copeland, what's your background? He said, sinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where we all came from. We were all sinners. He's just showing that there's no difference. We we're all uh, need a Savior. But notice the next verse, being justified freely by His, by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness 
Notice, declaring His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, no, but by the law of faith. He calls faith a law. Why? Because it works. It's a law of God. Gravity is a law of God. It works. Works when it's shine, sun shining. It works when it's raining. And all you have to do is to drop your Bible and find out that it works. It'll always fall down. It'll never fall up on the ceiling because it's a law. Now, you will notice here that he goes on to say, in verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Yes. Now, what he's talking about is the fact that under the old covenant there was no righteousness under the law. If there had been righteousness that came by the law, we would have still been under the law. And you have to read Ephesians and Galatians and, and, uh, uh, to get the whole picture there. Uh, we were kept under, they were kept under the law until faith should come. And then after faith has come, we're no more, more under the law. And that faith came through Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the Word of God. He was the Word personified, and faith cometh by hearing the Word. So he's the author, he's the finisher of our faith, and it's not God trying your faith. Jesus authored it, he knows it'll work. It's the devil trying your faith and not God. Amen. Now you will notice here, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Now what's he talking about here? We establish the law of the new covenant. The law of the new covenant is faith. He that believeth hath. Now, faith is a substance of things, hope for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I don't have to use faith to believe this podium is here. I can turn my head, I can feel it. Whether I believe it or not, it's still there. It doesn't change the thing. You use faith on things you can't see. Faith is a substance, giving substance too. We talked about it last night. It's a title deed. If the faith is there, you have the thing desired or the thing prayed for. Now, that just sounds too good to be true, but, but it, it's in the Bible, and it's what the Bible teaches. Now, listen to the words of Jesus. Whosoever shall say to the mountain, problem area in your life, he's not talking about moving to Rocky Mountains, whosoever sh shall say to the mountain of debt or mountain of, of physical illness or whatever, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, you'll never hinder me again as long as I live, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, how are you going to get around that? Take other scriptures back it up. Matthew 21, 22, all things. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. No stronger word in the English language than shall or will. Then Jesus said in John 15, 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done. Now you could include in that, ask what you will, say what you will, pray what you will, declare what you will, and it shall be done if it's based on the authority of the word. We're talking about Bible faith now. Now, I mentioned last night, Bible faith only comes from the Bible. It doesn't come from anywhere else. It doesn't come from hearing what happened to brother so-and-so or what happened to somebody else. It comes from the Word of God. You could have faith challenged or excited. Your faith might be uh, excited by hearing what happened to somebody else, but that's not real Bible faith. Bible faith comes only from the Word in the Bible. Now, while we're along that line, uh, let, let's go to this. In, in Romans, the 12th chapter, the Apostle Paul said, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. In other words, don't be squeezed into the world's mold, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, he's talking to people born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Bible-toting, full gospel businessmen. He said, you better do something about your mind. You got to get your mind renewed to the Word of God. 
Now, what's that mean? That means that uh, in Romans 8, he explains it a little more. He said, the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God. Now, what's the law of God? The law of faith. You can't believe with your head what you can believe with your heart. Now, when we talk about heart, we're not talking about the blood pump. So many times people say, get it down in your heart, and they point over here. That's not really the heart the Bible's talking about. It's talking about the core, the center of your being. And really, I believe it may not be technically right, but you can understand this. It is the, your spirit man, really. You get it down on the inside of you, it becomes a part of you. And they can't beat it out of you with a ball bat. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. But you hear people say, well, yeah, I know the Bible said that, Brother Catherine, but now here's what happened to me. Or here's what happened to Brother so and so and he believed that way. Now, what are they doing? They're casting out the Word in favor of experience. The Word didn't abide in them. And they wonder why it doesn't work. The Word doesn't abide in them. They believe more in experience than they do in the Word of God. What you experience in life never changes God's Word. But if you'll hold fast to the confession of God's Word, eventually it will change what you experience in life. Now, you heard the word eventually, didn't you? It won't happen overnight. I know it took me a while to get rid of that all, all that unbelief. When I got hold of this faith message, I'd like that cat you've seen hanging at the last knot at the end of the rope. It says, hang in there, baby. <laughs> Man, I tell you, I was hanging at the last knot at the end of the rope, and when I heard this message, I had to have it. I, I said, that's it, that's it. And you, I didn't have to hear it but once. And you know, it never occurred to me that it might not work, because Jesus said it would. He said, whosoever shall say. Now, see, I, uh, the pastor talked about Brother Hagin's book, Right and Wrong, uh, Right and wrong believing? How, how, what was it? Uh, right and wrong thinking, that's it, yeah. That's the first book I ever read uh, of Brother Hagin's, and, and it, it, it set me free and turned me in the right direction. Because I had had these thoughts at times, but, I, you know, everybody else was preaching something different. And, uh, and when, I, when I read that book, you know, he said, when you think wrong, you believe wrong. When you believe wrong, you act wrong. And, and I, I challenge you to get that book. But uh, when, I, when I got a hold of this message, I began to put these things into motion in my life. And it took a while to do it. Now, Paul said in Romans 12, Be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how do you renew your mind? With the Word of God. Now, how do you do that? By saying what God says? Now, you, a, a good illustration. Uh, I could take this pencil, stick it in this glass of water, and I'll not do it, and I'll splash water out, but you start doing it like this. First of all, it's just cutting water. That's all it's doing. But after a while, you keep doing it, the water starts following the pencil. Pull the pencil out, and the water keeps going. When you confess what God said long enough, you go to thinking like God thinks. And, and when you go to thinking like God thinks, things are going to change around your house. You're going to start believing different. And you've got to start talking different. And when you do, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And if you just check up, you've been having what you said all the time. Now, a friend of mine, he and his brother, they're, my friend teaches the word of faith, and the other's another denomination, and they kind of turn thumbs down because they don't understand it. And you know, you can't blame folks. If they'd been taught different, uh, they'd believe that way. And, and that you have to hear it. Faith cometh by hearing. And they'd sit down, they'd go out and cut wood and sit down and they'd rest and they'd talk about it. And he said, well, now, uh, that, that stuff just doesn't work for me. Uh, it, it just doesn't work for me. He said, I know it. Because you can have what you say. And you say it doesn't work. And really it is working. Because if it wasn't working, you'd be having what you said when, it, when you didn't say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean... It's working. That's the way it works. He shall have whatsoever he said. And he said, it doesn't work for me. I know it. I also know why. Doesn't have faith as a seed. Jesus said if you had faith as a mustard seed, you would say, 
he's telling you two great faith secrets in Luke 17. If you had faith as a seed, the first thing you'd do is plant it. You know how you get more seed? Plant it. Plant the one you have. In other words, you don't have to start out with great faith. If you just have faith as a seed. Now, there's several ways you can look at that. What kind of faith does a seed have? Seed has can-do faith. That seed says, you just put me in the ground, I'll show you what I can do. And of course, in the context there, you'll find out he's talking about the way you plant it is by saying it. So if you had faith as a seed, you would say. Now you hear so many people say, well, now, Brother Caps, I wouldn't say that every disease, germ, every virus touches my body dies instantly because it might not. It won't. <laughs> don't be concerned about it because you don't have faith as a seed. But if you say it long enough, you'll believe it. Now remember, I, I mentioned this last night. It bears repeating. In school, we stood up and, and we'd quote the multiplication tables over and over and over until we knew them by heart. They knew then that what you speak out of your mouth gets into your heart. Now the parable of the sower reveals that the Word of God is a seed. The heart of man is the saw, which is the production center. What determines what is produced by that saw? The seed you plant. The saw does not decide what to raise. Now, see, I farmed for 29 years, and I, I knew this. You don't go out there and plant soybeans. You know, we, I'd follow the planter. In the springtime, I'd, I'd lose two, three, five, six, ten pounds running behind the planter because you had uh, soft ground on one end of the field. You have hard ground on the other end. You set the planter, and, and up on the soft end, it would be going about right, and I'd run behind the planter and scratch every little bit and get down on the hard end, and it wasn't going but about that deep. We'd have to let it down a little to kind of get it balanced. And uh, I never did dig in the ground and hear that ground say, we're not raising soybeans. We're going to raise cucumbers and bananas. <laughs> no, it can't do that because the seed has dominion over the soil. So the words you're speaking has dominion over the heart, and, and your heart or spirit will lead you to, cause you to be in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, depending on what you are planning. Now, I know there's people that disagree with that. They say, oh, no, your spirit wouldn't, your heart wouldn't lead you wrong. Then why was Jesus using the parable of soil and seed to reveal this revelation? You can't get it any more accurate than that. The seed always has dominion over the soil. The soil never has dominion over the seed. Now you, the soil will do everything to a rock that it does to a seed, but that rock won't produce anything. There's no life in it. But the DNA of God is in the Word of God. And you plant it in the heart, and it's going to produce. And you won't know how, it, you won't necessarily know how it works. You just need to get the revelation that the mother of Jesus had, Mary had, at the marriage of Cana of Galilee. If you don't get anything else, else out of the service tonight but this one short sermon that was preached, one of the greatest sermons in the whole Bible, been very little said about it. When they needed a miracle, she said unto them, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, folks, that is the most outstanding sermon, and one of the most outstanding sermons in the whole Bible. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Seven words that will change your life. Just get your Bible and read the red, and whatever he said, do, do it. Change your life forever because of the law of faith. <clears throat> now, Paul went on to say in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, Be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, speak what God says to you who are believing and thinking like God thinks. And he says, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, God didn't give Oral Roberts more faith than He gave you, nor Kenneth Copeland more faith than He gave you. He dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, the problem is we've misunderstood what the measure was. 
He didn't say a measure, he said the measure. Now that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you got all the faith it was when you're born again. Now I know some look at it from that angle and I can kind of see what they're talking about. You have the ability when you're born again to believe the Word of God. But how do you measure faith? Do you have a quart or do you have a ton or do you have an ounce? The only way you can measure faith is by how much Word is in you. Faith cometh by the Word. Faith is resident in the Word of God. Faith is resident in this Word right here in this book. Now what is the measure of faith? That's it right there. That's all the Bible faith there is. In the pages of this book, and God dealt this Word to every person. But how much of this Word do you have in you? Now see, when a person gets born again, he may not know but one Scripture. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That might be the only scripture you knew when you got born again. Enough faith in that to get you born again. But how could you have all the faith there is just because you knew one scripture? Because faith cometh by hearing the word. Now, see, you could have great faith in being born again and no faith in healing. There, there's people that can get people born again. I mean, just get them saved, born again uh, by the hundreds because they, they take them down that Roman road, witness to them, and, and show them in the Scripture, uh, uh, the Scriptures that will cause them to have faith to be born again. But then in another area uh, concerning finances or healing or, or something else, they say, but, you know, God is not concerned about your finances. One fellow said to me one time, said, you, you don't pray about finances, do you? I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, I, I thought you, the Bible said you shouldn't pray about uh, financial things. I said, whose Bible have you been reading? He said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have. Well, the truth was he hadn't been reading anybody's Bible. All he knew about the Bible is what somebody said they thought they heard somebody said the Bible said. <laughs> so we've been misled. So see, God dealt to every man to measure faith. He gave His Word to mankind. This is the manufacturer's handbook. And if you will go by it, it'll work. It's the law of God. It's the perfect law of liberty. The reason it's called the perfect law of liberty, you cannot abuse the law of faith. I mean, I cannot pray that the pastor lose his billfold so I'll find his money, and that way God's going to supply my need. <laughs> my heart will condemn me, and my faith wouldn't work. Amen. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Now, you shouldn't have to say those things, but you do sometimes. Yeah. Because, you know, I had one, one fellow said to Happy Caldwell one time, he said, Brother Caldwell said, this faith stuff doesn't work. Confession doesn't work. He said, oh, why do you say that? Well, he said, I said 300 times one day I had a new car, and I didn't get it. Now, see, he only had a formula. He didn't have the principle. He just had a formula. And, you know, you wonder about folks like that sometimes. You wonder when they get up in the morning, how do they find the floor? <laughs> <laughs> do they jump off on the wall and slide down to the floor, you know? <laughs> he thought it was going to happen because he said it. No, it won't happen just because you say it. But saying it is involved in causing it to happen. But he must believe and doubt not in his heart and believe what he is saying will come to pass. Then he shall have whatsoever he saith. In other words, you've got to get your mind renewed to the Word of God. First stages of confessing the Word of God doing very little other than renewing your mind and causing faith to come. Doing very little change of circumstance. Now see, this is one of the missing links in the faith connection. And see, uh, you learn these things as you go, go along. See, I've been in this uh, uh, message and teaching it for, for nearly 30 years now. And, uh, and you learn some things over that period of time. Now, some of these young whippersnappers coming up, you know, like the pastor. <laughs> no. no, I thank God the Word is, is, is the final authority on the matter, you see. But you see, as you speak the Word of God, you hear your voice speaking the Word of God. And faith cometh by hearing. 
God bless you. We do appreciate you joining us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast today. Uh, we have an offer this week that I'm excited about. It's my book called Faith and Confession, How to Activate the Power of God in Your Life. Now, you know, I've been teaching this message for 25 years or more. I mean, I practiced it, practiced it before I taught it, and I have lived it for 25 years, and I know that it works. I'm not talking about something that I have a theory of. I'm talking about something that's based on the authority of the Word of God, and I tell you, it'll change your life. Now, some of the things we deal with in this book, is subjects, and we have a whole chapter on the gospel is the power of God. And you know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Well, what we talk about the gospel sometimes, we, we talk about some of the gospel. But I'm telling you, you need to get a hold of the full gospel and understand how to use the confession of the Word of God to change your life. Now, we have a chapter in here called Life and Death in Words. Proverbs says, Death and life is in the power of words. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We have a chapter called Faith, Corresponding Action. You should have corresponding action to your faith. But ask yourself, how far can you go with corresponding action? You see, you could not have full corresponding action if you didn't have full manifestation. Someone said, well, I wrote a check and put it in the mail, and I'm confessing that God will put the money in the bank before my check gets there. Well, I can tell you now, you'll be in jail before God puts the money in the bank because it's not His responsibility, it's your responsibility. Your corresponding action, as far as you could go with it, is write the check, put it in the dresser drawer, and wait till you have the money in the bank before you send it. You see, we're talking about a balance in the faith and confession message. And when you begin to understand that God Himself calls things that are not as though they were, you can see the principle all through the Bible. It is a principle upon which Jesus operated in all of His ministry. The last chapter of this book is called uh, Calling Things That Are Not. That'll change your life. It's uh, offer number 2509, Faith and Confession, 150 some odd page uh, paperback for $10.00. We have a toll-free order line, 1-877-396-9400. That's 1-877-396-9400. It's called Faith and Confession, offer number 2509. And I tell you, it'll change your life. It'll answer 90% of all the questions you've ever had about the Faith and Confession message. Until next time, this is Charles Kapp reminding you that the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see. We're glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. To order the product offered on today's program, send your check or money order to Charles Capps Ministries. Or to place your order on Visa or MasterCard, call 1-877-396-9400.